Hello, hello. Good afternoon. This is Leslie Sullivan. I am your lovely host for this lovely podcast entitled The Endurance of Labor Laws. This is episode 9, and we are diving into more of the specific labor unions within the United States of America. So, this next union, this one is kind of a doozy in terms of all the information that is um talking about this. because there are a lot of abbreviations and I tried to record this earlier and it and I always go back and re-listen to things and it was just too choppy so I'm going to try and summarize it better and try and just hit the highlights as opposed to just reading straight through it and then trying to go back so this is kind of a more intense verbiage wise of a labor union just because things change quite frequently sometimes with unions like if they merge with another union or if they had a scandal or different people came into power within a union you know things of that nature it makes it a lot of history so the union that we're going to be discussing today is the Service Employees International Union also known as SEIU so let's go ahead and get started on this one it was founded in uh, April 23 1921 in the Roaring 20s that's awesome in Chicago Illinois It is headquartered in Washington D.C. and it has 1,893,775 million. I'm oh, sorry, I take that back. One point. I'll just say a little over 1.8 million members as of 2014. Sorry, my eyes are a little tired. I'm filming this kind of late in the afternoon, so I'm just going to go ahead, going to go ahead and start reading some of this. It says that the SEIU is a labor union representing almost 1.9 million workers. in over 100 occupations in the United States and Canada. Um they focused on or they focus on organizing workers in three sectors. The healthcare um so it says healthcare over half of members work in the healthcare field including hospital, home care, nursing home workers and then the other sector is public services and then property services. And property services, I didn't know what that meant. just off the top of my head but it means it includes janitors, security guards and service food workers. So it says here that they have over 150 local branches. It is affiliated with the Change to Win Federation and the Canadian Labor Congress. And let's see. Uh it says the union is known for its strong support for democratic candidates which I completely disagree with. Again, I don't think it's appropriate at all for unions to openly support a political party because that puts their members under a lot of pressure to vote a certain way, to think a certain way and to speak a certain way and that infringes on the members' rights and their their right to vote the way that they want to because it can kind of be a uh, intimidation factor which I do I do not agree with at all. It says it spent 28 million dollars supporting Barack Obama in the 2008 presidential election. says here in 2012 SEIU was the top outside spender on democratic campaigns reporting almost 70 million dollars of campaign donations television ads and get out the vote efforts in support of president obama and other democrats SEIU is a major supporter of the affordable care act and of increased minimum wage laws including wage increases for fast food workers. Now, I don't agree with labor unions supporting the Affordable Care Act because I discussed that in a previous podcast regarding the Affordable Care Act and how labor unions have been supporting that law or they agreed with it uh, when it came out and was passed. I do agree with increasing wages for fast food workers because I think it's been too low for too long and fast food workers their wages have not kept up with inflation. much less um the standard of living you know a living wage is really important and it says here the union is the primary backer of the fight for 15 and that means 15 dollars an hour so then um talk a little bit about the history here it says the SEIU was founded on April 23 1921 in Chicago as the Building Service Employees International Union its first members were janitors elevator operators and window washers The union's membership increased significantly with a 1934 strike in New York City's garment district. In order to reflect its increasingly diversified membership, in 1968 the union renamed itself Service Employees International Union. In 1980 through 
Most of the union's growth came from mergers with four other unions, including the International Jewelry Workers Union and the Drug, Hospital, and Healthcare Employees Union. I kind of wondered if that was the case because when they have that many members, it makes me wonder what different types of workers and different types of occupations are included under that umbrella of a union. So I am for unions merging with others, but I'm also in favor of mer- uh, not mergers. I'm also in favor of unions. remaining a uh, single you know not merging you know with other unions and really hold fast to what your individual members need because sometimes when you merge and it's not always a bad thing but sometimes when mergers happen you kind of lose sight of what is specifically important for your specific members whether it's drug hospital healthcare healthcare workers you know whatever the case may be so i personally always like to make sure that someone's individual workers rights do not get left behind or overshadowed by someone else's because if they're overshadowed or forgotten then that's a form of um, inequality so we want to stay away from that um and it talks about some of the presidents uh, that or the people that were nominated for presidents within these unions and says here in 2003 SEIU was a founding member of the new unity partnership an organization of unions that push for a greater commitment to organizing unorganized workers into unions. Now that I agree with because you know sometimes with unions you have more workers rights unfortunately. It's like that. Um and it's it's one of those things sometimes you need a union to back you up and to protect you at your workplace. Um you know sometimes employers are not good employers. That doesn't mean they're all bad. but it's very much important to know your rights and that if if you want to have an organized union then you shouldn't have unorganized members so they kind of need to be brought into the fold to uh, better protect them their their workers rights their pay their health care health care benefits things of that nature that's really important so there is that right there And it says here in 2005 the SEIU was a founding member of the Change to Win Coalition which furthered the reformist agenda that kind of concerns me criticizing the AFL CIO for focusing its attention on electoral politics instead of encouraging organizing in the face of decreasing union membership. Okay, so I thought it was going to say something else but it's a little different here. So there there are unions that focus on membership which is what I think they should be focused on because you're really narrowing in and you know you really have a strong goal of for- focusing on workers rights. I personally do not agree with unions interfering with anything electoral and trying to push electoral politics. I think that's wrong. Because membership in the in the union members are more important than politics and unions are not supposed to be influencing elections. That is very disturbing to me that a union would even think about doing that. But sometimes that does happen. But here it sounds like a couple different unions were parting ways because they had some differences of opinions of how they wanted to operate their unions. And sometimes when you don't agree with someone, you do need to go your separate ways, especially when you're dealing with people, memberships and membership fees and dues, especially when you're dealing with monies and uh, funds. It's important to be on the same side with everybody, right? And if you don't agree, then you and your organization need to leave and do what you need to do. There's nothing wrong with respectfully leaving. So it says here uh, these differences boiled over on the eve of the 2005 AFL CIO convention as the SEIU and Teamsters announced that they were disaffiliating from the AFL CIO. The Change to Win Federation held its founding convention in September 2005. where SEIU Secretary Treasurer Anna Berger was announced as the organization's chair. Let's see. It says here in the following decade several change to win members disaffiliated and rejoined the AFL-CIO, leaving SEIU, the Teamsters and the United Farm Workers as the remaining members. The SEIU's decision to break away from the AFL-CIO is considered controversial by some labor experts. After the disaffiliation, the SEIU continued to experience significant growth in membership. It says here they had a change in uh presidencies within the organization and it lists all the different presidents going back to 1921 in terms of the organization. 
Let's see here. It says here, under the Stern and Henry presidency, so these two different people that had presidencies, SEIU has organized workers in a number of industries. In some cases, these organizing drives have been built around nationwide campaigns like Justice for Janitors campaign. It says SEIU has organized large numbers of home care attendants in Oregon, Missouri, and Wisconsin, among other states. in some cases working together with other unions. Now that I particularly very much agree with and here's why. There are so many home care attendants and home health workers that they make peanuts for the work that they do. Home health workers and home care attendants are some of the lowest paid workers that, that I have seen in the healthcare industry. I mean sometimes they make less than a janitor. It's really bad and all the work that they do in someone's home and they've got to be medically trained and things like that like it doesn't even always keep up with minimum wage. It's it's pathetic. And then a lot of these people, most of them women, um it's been my experience from what I've seen here in the state of Oklahoma, a lot of them are single mothers. I mean, they're single parents trying to raise probably several kids from what I've seen. And so it it's virtually almost impossible to live off of minimum wage anyway. And then it's just not a good standard of living for those workers so i think that they should be unionized if they are not already because you know this is kind of a slightly outdated article but it's important that you know when when someone's working that means they're working and they meet, they need and deserve a reasonable wage we're not even talking extravagant we're not even talking you know someone making $550,000 a year although that would be great and wonderful but you know just to have a good decent basic living wage should be the starting point especially for these types of workers because they're doing the grunt work that a lot of people do not want to do and should not do because some people just do not have the empathy or the sympathy or the character or the morals or values I should say to do that kind of work because it is hard because you you're you're dealing with people in their homes and you know they may be ill, they may be dying, they may have a chronic illness or maybe they they're just super old, like way elderly and they just need help around the house. Well, sometimes the elderly can be very combative. You know, maybe they've had a stroke or maybe some blood vessels have burst and you know, their personality has changed. Well, home care and home health workers have to deal with that. But yet they get paid one of the lowest wages. So there has been that. And let's see here. It talks about how they were organizing workers in Texas, Florida, Nevada, and Arizona in particular, and that's been going on since 2004. Let's see here. The next article it says in 2009 the union launched a nationwide campaign against I'm probably mispronouncing this, but so Dexo, S O D E X O, criticizing the company's labor standards. The union strategy, which was ultimately unsuccessful. involved organizing student groups to pressure administrators at universities to kick Sodexco out of school cafeterias unless the company permitted unionization. Sodexco USA filed a civil lawsuit against SEIU under the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act on March 17, March 17, 2011. In the complaint, Sodexco alleged that SEIU engaged in blackmail, vandalism, harassing trespassing and lobbying law violations referring to the cleanup Sodexco campaign as old-fashioned strong-arm tactics and SEIU behavior as a gro I can't pronounce that word but really bad behavior and illegal during the trial it was revealed that in 1988 the SEIU had co-written a manual detailing how outside pressure can involve jeopardizing relationships between the employer and lenders investors stockholders customers clients tenants, politicians, or others on whom the employer depends for funds. Tactics were recommended include references to blackmail and extortion, accusations of racism and sexism, targeting the homes and neighborhoods of business leaders for demonstrations, and also explicitly stated that at times it is necessary to disobey the law. Following the court discovery of this document, a settlement was reached where Stexco withdrew the lawsuit and SEIU terminated its public campaign focused on So Dexco. So obviously this union behaved very poorly. However, that doesn't take away how I word this. It doesn't eliminate the factor that the workers at these cafeterias 
have the right to unionize and they have the right to fair and decent wages and good working conditions. So yes, this union behaved very badly and that deserved to come out publicly. And so hopefully this union will learn from its mistakes that you know, when you resort to bad things, it reflects badly on your union. So, you know, always do good things. Don't do bad things. I mean, I would think that would be basic behavior because that's what we teach children, but sometimes I guess that falls through the cracks. But needless to say, the union was completely wrong in what they were doing. And I hope that these workers, I don't know much about, but I hope that these workers were actually able to unionize and I I hope that they were able to get better wages and better working conditions because I've worked in a cafeteria before when I was younger. It is tough. It is hard work. And it just always felt like we we were not paid enough considering how laborsome it is. I mean, it's it's it is tough. It really is. And it says here, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, since 1990, the SEIU has been the nation's top organization contributing to federal campaigns. Uh that kind of concerns me. Donating a little over 232 million dollars, 99% of which went to Democrats. I disagree with that. Doesn't matter which party, but they need to stay out of stuff like that. Over that same period, the National Education Association, also known as NEA, was the second highest organizational political donor, contributing a little over 96 million dollars, 97% of which went to Democrats. Again, I don't agree with that. They need to stay out of elections. Since 1998, the SEIU has spent a little over 19 million dollars in additional money on lobbying. Now, I'll say this about lobbying. I'm not a big fan of it. It's not just for unions, but any kind of lobbying um uh, venture because I don't always trust necessarily what a lobbyist says because it's like their opinion can be bought and sold. I would rather hear directly from the citizens about stuff. You know, if they're in a particular industry, I would want to specifically hear from them, but lobbyists, they're just paid to say that. They're just they're just a professional mouthpiece. So, even though it is considered an occupation, I don't agree with that occupation. because when i truly believe about something i don't i don't have to get paid to speak up about something so when someone has to get paid to speak up about something that tells me they are not genuine and they don't really mean it and there's an ulterior motive so the next section goes over specific local branches i'm not going to go each individual one because it's it's pretty lengthy and then it kind of mentions um one little local chapter in canada but not much about it and it says here let's see According to SEIU's Department of Labor records since 2005 when membership classifications were first reported about 2% of the union's membership are considered retirees which I'm assuming or guessing that will greatly increase since more baby boomers are retiring since this time with eligibility to vote in the union SEIU contracts also cover some non-members known as agency fee payers which since 2005 have numbered comparatively about 1/10th of the size of the union's membership. As of 2014, this accounts for about 35,000 retirees and about 180,000 non-members paying agency fees compared to about 1.8 million regular members. And it talks about where their archival and historical materials are kept cuz they they keep a lot of records which is always good. So I wanted to go over that union just quickly. Um and I know that was way shorter than some of my other podcasts, but I didn't want to get bogged down in just line by line specifics of all these different local chapters, but you know what's really interesting is that the 20s were a very interesting time if you think about it. Um cuz you know we're coming out of World War 1 and things are the closer you get to the 1930s the more things are revving up to World War 2 specifically in Europe so you know there's a lot of things that happen all around the same time so what would be interesting to see is what unions were founded and when over in Europe that's kind of i guess will be one of my next series is to look at labor unions in Europe because some of them sometimes we mimic each other sometimes the united states mimics european unions and vice versa but either way it is very important to to remember that as a worker you have rights whether your employer acts like it or not and i'm from oklahoma so i don't remember if i've said this before because it's several podcasts back i bet but um oklahoma is a at will state 
So for those that live outside the United States and are listening to this, an at-will state means that an employer can fire you at will for any reason whatsoever and you're basically screwed if you are the employee. So, and I don't agree with that. Um because there are a lot of people that get fired for doing the right thing, for speaking up about something and sometimes it's a whistleblower situation. And other times um like women get fired for not being okay with harassment and reporting it. Or even if they don't report it, they try and tell a person, "Hey, please stop harassing me. I I don't deserve that. Please stop." And then unfortunately, sometimes women make the mistake of not reporting that to HR because then what happens is the person that they told, "Hey, don't harass me." that hurts my feelings or it's inappropriate whatever the case may be unfortunately sometimes that person that is harassing them is very vindictive and very evil and so they go to HR before the woman uh, reports anything if she does and they make it seem like they're the victim i mean it, it gets old when the oppressor tries to play the victim it it's and i'm just always surprised when HR falls for it. i just kind of roll my eyes at this because it's 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 just the oldest trick in the book and you would think HR would care but they the HR departments I try and be nice about them but over the years they've just gotten worse and so over the years I've kind of leaned away from trusting HR departments and I I trust unions more and um the reason for that is that HR departments more and more are just there to protect the company's posterior like they just want to help the company not get sued And the way they do that is they help get rid of employees that speak up about things, report things. And even though I'm sure they're going to be there's going to be some HR managers and HR employees that call me or email me and say, "No, you're wrong. We care." And it's like, "Look, you know, you can say that all day and all night, but we all know there are situations where that is just simply not true. I've never known HR to really care about people." I never have and the word human is in the job title. I mean it's just like how can you say you you care about people and in your job title it says human resources but then people are losing their jobs, they're losing their wages, they're losing their benefits. So typically what happens when someone gets fired like that, which is very unfortunate, I completely disagree with it. But when they do get fired um for stupid stuff that gets thrown around at them. What happens to the worker is they lose their health insurance and then if they choose to go on cobra, it's very expensive. It's kind of like a supplement health insurance. It sucks. It's not that good. It's typically way more expensive than than just regular health insurance. So if it was me, what I would do if I lost my job, whether I was let go or fired or terminated or you know, quit or whatever the case may be, but especially if I was fired or terminated or you know whatever wording you want to use if i lost my health insurance i would not go on cobra i would immediately look for a short term health insurance policy to buffer the cost of any kind of health situations that might occur or health situations that are currently happening in my life that's what i would do because there are some really good short term health insurance policies out there and they are specifically for situations like this where you just need something to help keep you covered and this this isn't in this isn't necessarily just because of Obamacare because now part of that law um no longer exists where you're forced to have health insurance but you know even when people lost their health insurance before Obamacare took effect you could still buy a policy that was you know kind of running interference for you in terms of like football terms would run interference for you until you found a good permanent full-time position and then you apply for the new health insurance you don't cancel your current insurance that you purchased you know the short-term one you apply for the full-time long-term one and then once you receive the okay that you have received or you are part of that health insurance policy with your employer and you receive the health insurance member ID cards that's when you cancel the other policy that's what i personally would do And I bring this up because that's one reason why I've had my own health insurance. I think it's been oh, how many years has it been now? 12 years, I think. I think it's been 12 years because I've been a private consultant slash private contractor, but I predominantly worked in accounting and uh, actually data IT analytics as well. Like I've had several different contracts, 
um, throughout that time and learned a lot of different software programs and, and helped people um, with their company and their data and, and helped them in that regards as well. And I also worked as an auditor. I forgot about that. But, um, you know, I, I lost my health insurance when a job ended, and it didn't end, like, horribly bad. I still don't agree with what happened. But um, I lost my health insurance, and health insurance was crap. It wasn't that good. I can't remember if I talked about this previously, but um, I had an intim- a, uh, intimidator. I had an employer that was trying to intimidate me to sign a legal document stating that I forfeit my vacation pay when I quit my job. And that is absolute bull. I refused to sign that form. And I told him, I was like, oh, well, let me take the form home and I, I will check with my, my family's attorney. I'll have him take a look at it and I'll get back with you. Well, immediately they called me back into the office and said, oh, we don't, we don't need to do that. That's okay. You know, you know we, we will give you your vacation pay. It's okay, you know. Because they were trying to say that that a handwritten note, which this was back in the day when, you know, not everybody owned a fancy computer or a printer at home. Because that was back in the day when printers were expensive. You would just handwrite a note. You know, you could you can handwrite a letter of resignation. So that's what I did. I handwrote a letter of resignation. I just said, I'm giving you my two weeks notice effective as of this date. My last work of day or my last day of employment will be such and such date. You know, sincerely, Leslie Sullivan or whatever. It was it was very clean cut, professional, even though things were not going that well. Because my manager, uh, it, it was a woman, and she was uh, she was a viper. Um, she uh, was a dirty dog snake. Um, she would intentionally try and mess up my schedule to get me fired. And that's some some things that that's one of the things that employers do to try and make it seem like the employee was bad, just so they can. Um, legally fire them and try and make it seem like they they can't get um, what's it called unemployment um, paychecks and things like that. They can't file unemployment even though they can. So um, I knew they were trying to do something shady, and it was my manager, which was a woman, and then these two other bosses higher ups. And I was in this um, main manager's office, and they were just bullying me right and left. The three of them. It was three against one. And I stood my ground. I just treated it professional and business like, even though my heart rate was all over the place. It just sickened me. I was being treated like that. And um, so I just treated it cool, calm, and couth, as I always say. And I just said, I need to have my uh, family's attorney uh, take a look at this, and I'll get back with you. I just said, look, I'm not really familiar with legal forms, which isn't necessarily true. But and I guess in regards to these shady people, I wasn't familiar with their shady form. And what they're trying to do, but I knew it wasn't on the up and up. I could just tell straight up it was bad, just from the verbiage they had in there. And they're trying to, with really squirrely wording, they're trying to get me to forfeit uh, my last paycheck as well as my my check for vacation pay that I wasn't receiving and I was supposed to receive it. And so when I mentioned um, having our lawyer take a look at it, that's when they completely changed their tune. Oh, Leslie, we don't need to do that. And so, and uh, but previously they had said that this isn't a proper letter of resignation, and so therefore you forfeit blah blah blah, you forfeit all these monies. I was like, no, actually it is a proper letter of resignation. You know, just because you don't like what kind of paper it's written on, which it was just regular paper. Like they were trying to use every trick in the book. I guess they thought I was a moron, and I guess what they do works on other people, but it didn't work on me. And they, they tried to say it wasn't a legitimate um, letter of resignation. And I was like, yes, it is. And so that's how they were trying to get out of paying me my wages, was saying it's not a legitimate form of letter of re- resignation. And so um, I did get my last paycheck. I did get my vacation pay that I was supposed to get, but it was taxed at a higher rate, unfortunately, because they had to pay it all at once. And that was one of the things that we were not agreeing about. Was let me take my vacation pay. You know, let me take my vacation when I need to, because I was using it for, um, you know, to go see family. I had, I think, I had a family member that was graduating from high school or something, or maybe middle school or something. I can't remember what it was. And then um, I got sick, and they were not allowing me to use my sick leave or my vacation leave, but yet they were complaining that I couldn't be at work, and so they were trying to fire me for for getting sick. And it's just like, have you forgotten about the Family Medical Leave Act? And then they try to act like that doesn't apply to me because I'm not married. So I was like, oh, so marital status discrimination. Thanks a lot. I'm not falling for that. Um, the Family Medical Leave Act applies to every worker. 
It doesn't matter what your marital status is. But you see, that was one of the that still is one of the problems in Oklahoma when you get in these Bible Belt states. You know, the more they claim to be Christian, the more it's basically a lie. I've noticed that. Like, I actually work better with atheists and agnostics because they don't try and pull that religious crap. Because they they just keep it real. I mean, I may not agree with every little thing that comes out of their mouth or the way they think, but I've worked with atheists and ag and agnostics, and they don't pull the shenanigans that some of these so called Christians do in the workplace. It's it's really interesting. I mean, that would make a great human behavior study right there, and whatnot. And also, you know, just living in the Bible Belt, it's um, you you definitely get looked down upon if you're not married by a certain age and you're a woman. I think I've already discussed that in a previous podcast, but it's pretty pathetic how people treat women. And you'd be surprised; it doesn't matter whether um, you have a manager that's a woman or a boss, or sorry, a woman or a man. Um, they both look down on single women, regardless of what the age of the single woman is. But the older you get and the longer you're single, the, the worse it looks on you. Like it's, they make it seem like it's a lack of character. When it's not, it's like you know your marital status belongs to you, and it's technically between you and God, and or the person that you may or may not be getting married to. So it's you know your private life is just that it's private, and I don't know how many times I had to say that that you know, thank you for your concern about my dating life, but you know my private life is private. You know we need to keep business at work about business, not about my private life because I don't bring that to work and I don't bring my work home. And whenever I would say that, and I would say it in a very kind, polite, full, professional way, and it's like the nicer I was about, the more the more pissed off they got because they knew I was right, and I was not going to lower my standards to their level because they basically had no standards. So, and that's the problem with people that don't really have morals and values, and they don't have any standards. It's that it's like if you sink that low, then how how can you judge what's right and wrong? It's really bizarre. Because everybody knows right from wrong, and I'll give an example. You know when someone's offended you. Reason being, your your conscience and your subconscious and, and your your soul knows when something's not right. And so, you know, pe you know, whenever people try and tell me, oh, you know, they're just doing what they're supposed to do, like, no, I don't fall for those cop outs. I don't. I think it's a cop out. To say they're just doing their job. No one is supposed to be screwing someone out of their money and jipping them. Because there's another thing: when they were trying to jip me out of my monies, my paycheck and my vacation pay money and my sick leave money, um, they they were messing with my taxes, which that really irritates me. I mean, it bothers me anyway losing my pay. Someone trying to mess with my pay. But when someone tries to mess with your your wages, they are interfering with you filing your taxes in a proper manner, and they're technically changing what tax bracket you're in, which that is really frustrating and annoying, and it's very unethical. So, but you know, my point being that you know when I was working at this place and it was a retailer, um, I was totally trying to get people unionized. Oh man, it was. It was like pulling teeth because those managers they had so much say so over people like they would just play these mind manipulation things and threaten to fire people and I was like man we need to be unionized and I'm a Republican saying this I'm a capitalist saying this but I found that workers' rights are not really guarded and protected in at will states like in Oklahoma it's almost like the more religious a state pretends to be and I say pretends because they're really not religious I mean. If you want to pull out specific examples, you know, but I find that whenever they try and be more religious, the more employment violations there are, which is really sad, and it's just really disturbing because you know, I, I mean, I am Christian, and you know, I love Jesus, and you know, I know that God is my heavenly Father, and you know, it's because of my faith in God, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's because of my faith in Jesus Christ. That I know I have rights, and I know how I'm supposed to behave and how I'm not supposed to behave. And I think that if people were true Christians, they would not be practicing any form of discrimination whatsoever. But unfortunately, some people they they give themselves permission to act however they want, and I think they view it as just their own little personal theology. But also, people forget that however you act in the workplace. Is technically how you're supposed to act out in the real world because the workplace is the real world. So there's some people that they act one way at church, 
They per, they put on their fake church behavior, which I can't stand. But then once they step foot on the employer's property, if they're a manager, sometimes they act completely different, completely unethical, completely immoral, don't give a rat's posterity about the safety of employees. And that's why they typically are anti-union, which I completely disagree with. Because I've noticed that some of the happiest employees are those that are in unions because they know they have workers' rights and they are guarded and protected. So that's just one of the things that I've noticed. Oh, and they tend to have better benefits as well. It's it's not as shady. I'm not saying unions are perfect because they're not because obviously we've had some examples here that I've read off that they did some pretty unethical things and bad things, but that doesn't reflect their original charter and their original mission. Now for sure they should never act that way again and they should be called out on that because if you don't call someone out on something then they're going to continue to misbehave and behave in a very improper, illegal and unethical and immoral fashion and we don't want that because when a union acts like that it's the members that suffer not the higher ups it's the members that suffer and they don't deserve that so it really comes down to having good leadership that actually believes in the original mission of the union which is what I talked about in one of my previous podcasts that these unions that don't behave correctly you know they need to get back to their roots they need to get back to the original goal because i think that's where they will be the most successful because that's what made them successful as opposed to going off on all these tangents with all these different causes that you know causes can change from day to day month to month year to year decade to decade but what doesn't change is um workers rights safety and you know like things with osha and also things that don't change is wanting a better society in a safe society whether you know it's outside the workplace or at the workplace you know some things don't change some things do but some things don't and it's usually the intangible things that don't change and the things that don't change are usually the things that are worth fighting for which would be um your freedoms and your rights so um but anyway so that is the end of this podcast um as usual i pray that you are happy healthy and whole and that you are very prosperous and very blessed. If you have any questions, concerns or comments, feel free to message me um from my podcast website. So until next time, have a good day and a good week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.